different ways. Um, let me just check. Oh no, that was just Chaz, Chaz telling that I'm ad-libbing. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything else that we do that I could tell you about? End of this one. Yeah, so coffee at the back. We're hoping for that to return to normal uh, in February. Um, so that'll be really nice. We, I know we've all missed that. Um, we'll be going back to normal on that front. I think I'm just going to have to go. Yeah. Great. Well, um, then I'll let you know about the... Um, uh, the other announcement, and there's a slide for this one, uh, next week is our Thanksgiving and Memorial service. So this is our annual service we do as a time of remembrance. So we set aside this time to uh, remember people who have passed. Um, it's a really important service to us. It's also, it's really important, it's a service that we can invite people to because we will know people who have lost people and actually a service like this can be a really important time to, to mark that, to you know, set aside some time just to kind of together um, remember the people. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll see you there. And if there's anyone you think uh, would benefit from that, just, just let them know and offer to chum them along to the service. Uh, but that's all the announcements we have. So shall we gather together in worship? Uh, we're going to start with our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord. Our reading today comes to the Psalms, and Caroline has done a reading. Now, uh, Caroline lives in Canada, so it is the middle of the night at the moment. So she was kind enough to pre-record her reading. So we'll have our reading now.
quite the backdrop, wasn't it? Uh, thank you, Caroline, for that. Um, I wanted you to start today by thinking, have you got any favourite songs? In particular, can you think of any songs that have really good memories associated with them? The kind of song that the minute it starts playing, it takes you to a really specific place and a really specific set of memories. Well, I have some of them, and uh, the reason it's because it's connected to family, because it's connected to actually my grandfather. I think you've got a picture of, yeah, there's my grandpa there. He, he was a bank manager in a Highland village, and he actually retired the year I was born. So I grew up just believing that he retired to become a grandpa. I mean, of course you would. Why wouldn't you want to spend all your time with that little cherub there? Um, and he was given gifts, and people were really generous when he left. He was given a camera that ended up being... In fact, there's a good chance that photo was taken on the camera because my parents ended up getting it. Uh, he was given a word processor. My grandfather was a, a tech illiterate for his whole life. Even in the 1950s, the tech was too much for him. But the word processor was just as much as he could handle. And he, he got this, the life out of this thing. When everybody else had moved on to computers, he was still plunking away in his word processor. And... The people in the bank clubbed together and they got him a, a hi-fi system, like a really fancy one. So um, I think we've got a picture of one of them, what they look like. I don't know if anybody remembers those. As a child, this was like wizardry. All those buttons and they had the little, that little display that changed with the music. Oh, it was just the height of, of you know, technology. There was only one problem. To my knowledge, my grandfather owned one CD and he only ever played one CD ever in this very fancy piece of equipment. And do you know what that one CD was? It was ABBA Gold, the 1992 compilation album of the greatest hits of ABBA. So whenever I hear any songs from that, any classic ABBA hits, I, I, I mean, I maybe I think a little bit of Mamma Mia films, but for me, actually, where I go to is my grandparents' house in Bewley in their big living room, booging out with my sister and my grandfather. It's very clear memory of that, that very hi-fi system and that very CD, and it just takes me back. But I think all of us have songs that do that, don't we? don't we? You know, we have songs that are so connected to certain memories, and particularly memories that are really joyful, really happy, songs that make us, you know, really lift us up and make us want to dance or to sing. And that reminds me of our passage today. Now, last week we read Psalm 1, the first Psalm, and this week we read Psalm 150, which is the last Psalm. And it really does go out with a bang. You know, praise God for what he's done. Praise God with trumpets, hearts, uh, harps, cymbals, and dancing. Praise, praise God. What, you know, what 150 is describing is, is a holy cacophony, you know, all those instruments, loud, brash instruments, making a really joyful noise, a truly song, a song of celebration. And maybe this could seem a little bit happy clappy, but you've got to remember the journey that you go on if you read the Psalms from 1 through to 150. Because what makes the Psalms so special is that they, they deal with every part of life. You know, there are Psalms of anguish, Day and night I cry, and tears are my only food. That's it's dense, isn't it? It's very heavy. Uh, but there's psalms of regret. My guilt has overwhelmed me. Psalms of isolation. My friends and neighbours avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbours stay away. And psalms of homesickness. You know, by the rivers of Babylon, uh, we, we sat and we wept when we remembered our home. You know, the psalms go through everything, and they don't shy away from the hard parts of life. But if you read them, you'll notice that as you get closer and closer to the end, there's more praise, there's more celebration. It builds and builds and builds. And then you hit 150, and it's just complete praise and celebration. And that's really the message of the Psalms. It, it doesn't hide away from the difficult things, but more and more it goes on, the more it ends in joy. It, it's such a message of hope. So... The Psalms, they, they build this point. There's a, a really lovely line in Psalm 30. It says that weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's a really lovely sentiment that no matter what we're going through, no matter what happens, you know, things can be difficult in the moment and, and that's okay, but it has this hope that things will get better and that there will be time for praise and celebration. 
And I wonder what it would have been like to hear the Psalms as they were originally written and they were originally made, uh, hearing them with the cymbals, with the harps, with all that noise. It must have been such a joyful time, and people would have created such wonderful memories with these songs. And that has carried on through the years because the Psalms have always been part of our worship, particularly in Scotland. The Psalms played such a key role, and people built memories around them. Uh, and hopefully we can do that too that as we learn about psalms or hymns or any of the songs that we love, we can build those memories of joy uh, and they can stay with us. You know, when times are tough, we can remember that, that feeling of joy and celebration uh, and have hope uh, in God's plan that that's where it ends. It doesn't end in sadness. It ends in joy. So we're going to pray now and we're going to lift our prayers to God and then we are going to say together the words that Jesus taught us to pray. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the, the wonderful good news we have. We, we pray that we can be filled with the joy of that, with celebration. We pray that we can really take seriously that you have called us to a life that's full of life and love and happiness. And we pray that we can, we can show that. We can be grateful for all the wonderful things we're blessed with and, and live as though we have good news. We thank you for the psalms and for our hymns and for all the pieces of music that speak of your goodness and your love. We thank you that they are there for us, that no matter what stage of life we're in, we can go back to them and they can remind us of all those good things. We pray that we, when we sing, when we worship, when we connect with music in any way, that we can do so in order to get to know you better in order to experience you and love you more deeply. And we pray using the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Linda is now going to bring us our second reading. Sorry, I've not got the snow today, but we've got the sun outside, which is just as nice, I hope. <laughs> Second reading is from Exodus, uh, chapter 35, reading from verse 20. The people bring their offerings. All the people of Israel left, and everyone who wished to do so brought an offering to the Lord for making the tent of the Lord's presence. They brought everything needed for use in worship, and for making the priestly garments. All who wanted to, both men and women, brought decorative pins, earrings, necklaces, and all kinds of gold jewelry, and dedicated them to the Lord. Everyone who had fine linen, blue, purple, or red wool, cloth of goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, or fine leather brought it. All who were able to contribute silver or bronze brought their offerings for the Lord. And all who had um, acacia wood, which could be used for any work, brought it. All the skilled women brought fine linen thread and thread of blue and purple and red wool, which they made. They also made thread of goats here. The leaders brought carnelias and other jewels to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece, and spices and oil for the lamps for the anointing oil, and for the sweet-smelling incense. All the people of Israel who wanted to brought their offering to the Lord for the work which he had commanded Moses to do. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. Now, today, I'd like to do something we haven't done for a long time, and this is going to require the people in Zoom, because we're stuck here, but you are out there in the world. What I'd like you to do is, if anybody has anything to hand, would you be able to grab some art 
something artistic that's in your home that you could show the rest of us. Uh, what to do is maybe use the like raise your hand function, then Pauline can spotlight you so that you can see. But I'll give you just a couple of seconds to go and look for something. I can't actually see the screen properly. Uh, Norman, you'll have to keep me right just in case. Oh, no, I can't see either. Oh, well, I can sort of see if I bend like that. In the meanwhile, um, has anybody seen any good uh, films recently? We have a lot of that blooming day. Uh, did anybody watch it? What do you see, Alice? We watched Twilight last night. That was an experience. I've never seen it before. Um, uh, what else? Um, oh, is anybody watching the new David Attenborough? Oh, it's really good, isn't it? Really good. Uh, has anybody from Zoom got anything they can show us? What can we see? Max, what have you got to show us? I, my friend's mum creates these uh, pieces of art on sort of mini easels. Uh, I don't know how well you can see the um, size of it, but it's just miniature, just quite a nice piece of uh, painting. Oh, lovely. That must be really hard because it's small to get the detail on that. Oh, fab. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there are any others that folks are ready to show us yet. Leslie, what, Leslie, what do you have to show us today? Um, this, this is a, a gift for my 50th birthday a few years ago, um, which is this, which, which looks like a photo, but it's actually a cross stitch, which oh, someone, oh, wow. uh, which my stepdaughter spent about nine months making for me. But yeah, I don't know how, how much detail you can see, but it is actually hand stitched. That's incredible. Well, thank you for showing this. Uh, and was there one more to show? Was it Pat? Oh, Pat. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Who made that, Pat? Oh, that's James. Oh, James. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't see you. James, that is a lovely picture. Uh, thank you for showing that to us. It's just for his mummy. Oh. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, was there one more? Uh, Pat, there you are, Pat. What do you have to show us, Pat? Uh Oh, we can't hear you. That's it. Look. Yeah, it says I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Anyway, can you still hear me? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. I've got to unmute myself. Never mind. Um, it's just this. Um, poppies have always been my favourite flower, and this is kind of something I bought in uh, Alapool at the Highlands Stoneware with a big poppy on it. It's a, like for a, a pot stand. Hmm. Oh, lovely. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll go for that now. Uh, thank you for showing us all those things. And, you know, you're on the Zoom call afterwards, so you can show everyone the, the rest of your things. I wanted to do that because today we're going to be talking about art. And when you say the word art, it can very quickly give up an image of going to you know, a fancy gallery um, with huge price tags or sipping red wine, talking as well, I can see the late post-impressionist influences in this piece, you know, that kind of thing. That's what you think of often when you say art. But the reality is we're actually surrounded by art all the time. Every day there's music that plays on the radio, there's the stuff that's on TV, there's the book that we're reading and that painting in the hallway that we pass every day. And in fact, we've had a, the Zoom folks, but for the people in the room, can you see any art around you? What can you see? Well, we've got the banners. That's a pretty obvious one. Um, the banner group made those. You've got the, the window. That's a long Christian tradition, the stained glass window. And then there, of course, there is the building itself, the roof. I, I found out some things about the building um, designed by John F. Matthew, who was a partner of Robert Lorimer, who designed the National War Memorial and the, the Warriston. Uh, and interestingly, the guy who built this building, his son designed the Commonwealth Pool. Who knew? Um, it's famous you know, in a, in a cruciform shape, so the whole building is in the shape of a cross. That's why we've got that kind of these two bits and then the length there. Uh, and the roof, I've never been able to confirm this, but it's said to resemble an upturned ship with the wood. I also found this reference. I really hope somebody can confirm with me if this is true. It was written in a book of Granton Parish Church. WC, so the toilet, of merit with entire set of original fittings, including paper holder and door with attached mirror. These now move to the City of Edinburgh Museums, spring 1998. Did our, did our toilet go to a museum? 
what a weird story. I, yeah, I wasn't sure about that one, but I, said, I did find it anyway. I really hope it is true. I really hope that somewhere that the original Grant and Parish Church toilet is in some, some museum collection, a piece of art. But we are surrounded all our days by art and by music. And I wanted to talk about it today because I think it's one of the ways that we can find God is through art. Um, Somebody last week said to me, uh, is God hiding? Because we keep talking about finding God. Uh, Maybe what I want to say then is maybe not finding God. It's more about rediscovering God or discovering God in new and fresh ways. Um, And art is ideal for that. It was C.S. Lewis who said, the first demand of any work of art makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive. Get yourself out of the way. The point of art is to make us think and feel things that we otherwise wouldn't do. Have you ever been to a cathedral and then just, you couldn't help yourself but look up? That's by design. They they wanted you to do that. The, The point of building a great big cathedral is to give you that sense of awe and wonder, to draw your eyes up heavenward and give yourself a new perspective. And that's what art does. It challenges us. It helps us see with new eyes and it can inspire us. And God can speak to us through art. Now, I brought my book along here. Um, It's written by, now, can I get the name? Thomas. How do you say this man's name? Henry Noun? Yeah, so go for Thomas, our Dutchman, for the correct pronunciation. I'm going to just continue to butcher it. Henry Nouwen was a a Dutch um, priest, uh, and one time he was visiting a friend, and on the wall he saw a printed poster of Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son, Can we see? Yeah, it's actually dark, so it's hard to see. Um, That's part of the way the painting works, is it's very dark with these little bits of light that draw you into it. He saw that and was absolutely transfixed. Uh, The friend was a bit confused as to why this person wasn't speaking. And so he asked, oh, do you like it? And at the time, Henry Noun, he replied, it's beautiful, more than beautiful. It makes me want to cry and laugh at the same time. I can't tell you what I feel as I look at it, but it touches me deeply. And then eventually he got the chance to go to, at the time, Leningrad, uh, now St. Petersburg, uh, to the Hermitage Museum where that actual painting hangs. And he spent about four hours looking at it. He clearly was grabbed by this painting. Uh, And he turned his experience with the painting into this book, which I really recommend. It's a fantastic book. But it's really interesting. As a priest, he had obviously read the story of the prodigal son time and time again. He knew it, like I'm sure most of us here do. But seeing that painting made it different. He really began to experience it. Um, And this is what he wrote about, his experience of encountering God through that painting. Spoiler alert, but I'll read you just the last section of the book and to get a sense of how much of an impact it had on him. When four years ago I went to St. Petersburg to see Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son, I had no idea how much... I would have to live with what I then saw. I stand in awe at the place where Rembrandt brought me. He brought me from the kneeling, dishevelled young son to the standing bent over father, from a place of being blessed to a place of blessing. As I look at my own ageing hands, I know that they have been given to me to stretch out towards all who suffer, to rest on the shoulders of all who come and offer the blessing that emerges from the immensity of God's love. He had this incredible experience and it was all rooted in this painting that he saw. And, you know, one of the places we can find God is in Christian art. And there's obviously a lot of really good Christian art. In fact, some of the greatest works ever made, you know, there's The Last Supper, Michelangelo's David, the Sistine Chapel, St. Peter's Basilica. That's just Italy in the Renaissance. Uh, There's, you know, so much beautiful art that's been created to depict stories from the Bible or truths about the Christian faith. Um, And music is similar, you know, so many great hymns. But I think we can also sometimes experience God in art that wasn't created as Christian art. Now, I bear with me. I genuinely think that one of the best examples of Christ-like love in any piece of art in recent years has to be this masterpiece. It is the Paddington films. But I, I stand, I will stand by this. This is the hill I'm willing to fight and die on. Um, I genuinely think that you would be hard-pressed to find a better example of a film that's about love. 
love that is patient and kind, that bears with people. And this bit is from the prison scene, and that might be my absolute favourite. The Paddington gets sent to prison. Um, a weird, you wouldn't have thought that would be a storyline, but it is. Um, and he meets all these hardened criminals, and then he wins them over. And by his, his generosity and his kindness, he, may, he turns the prison into this, this wonderful place. And it's, it's a really nice story about, essentially, redemption and how love can transform even a really hopeless place. We can find sources of inspiration and insight in all sorts of places. I think God often wants to speak to us through unusual things, through things that we wouldn't normally expect. And all it requires from us is to pay attention. This would have been last year. Um, I was setting up for a Friday drop-in, and I got everything set up really quickly. So I had a bit of time on my hands. So what do you normally do when you've got a bit of time on your hands? You just go on your phone and waste a bunch of time. But for some reason, I, I managed to put down the phone, uh, and I ended up sitting, uh, just right by where you are, Barbara, sitting there. And I ended up looking up and noticing, I actually can't see it from here, the window. Now, it might be because the, the panelling had just been removed. It might have just been the kind of day. but. I really noticed that window for the first time. I've been looking at that window for five years, and just it's just a window. But that day, it really grabbed me, the color, the shape, the way that it brings light into the space. Um, I really did experience it differently. I got this real sense of peace, and also this really nice sense that the drop-in I was about to do, you know, I wasn't going to be doing it alone. I was going to be doing it with Jesus. That that Jesus was going to be there with me. Nothing had changed about the window. The only thing that changed was that I was paying attention. And that's what we can do. Really, the thing about art is it doesn't have any magical properties. It can't necessarily do anything. But what happens is when we pay attention, when when we look and we're ready to have God interrupt us, that that can be a space where God can speak to us and we can experience something of God. So we'll have more time to look at this, but for now we're going to be encountering another piece of art. We are going to be singing together and we're going to sing our next hymn, Sing of the Lord's Goodness. Thank you. 
So we can find God in the art that we see, that we listen to, that we consume, but we can also find God in the art that we make. So our reading today that Linda read for us comes from the book of Exodus, and Exodus is infamous for starting strong and then getting really dry. So you open it and it's a real page turner. You've got burning bushes, you've got babies in baskets, pillars of fire, it's fantastic. And then you get into the middle of the book and then all of a sudden the rest of it is measurements. It's uh, measurements of buildings, measurements of cloth, measurements of priestly clothing and page after page after page of it. It is a bit of a slog. For one example, this is just a little snippet from Exodus. Make upright frames of Acadia wood for the tabernacle. Each frame is to be 10 cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, with two projections set parallel to the other. On the north side, and then it just repeats it over and over again. It could be a dry read for us, but that's because we're not seeing the finished uh, project. Imagine the difference between getting to see that cathedral we were talking about earlier and then seeing the blueprints of that cathedral. The blueprints are not going to capture anything of what it's like to actually be in that space. Because was the difference is for them, these dimensions, these quite dry and boring descriptions, they would have been able to see as a piece of art that had been made. Now, they're describing what they call the tabernacle, the tent of the Lord. And you might be wondering, what is a tabernacle? It was a sort of a tent temple that the Israelites built so that they could have a place to worship wherever they went. Because from after the time that the Israelites left Egypt, they were a nomadic people. They had no fixed home of their own. So what the tabernacle was, was this traveling temple, a sacred space that could come with them wherever they went. It was a really special and important place to them. And our reading today in Exodus 35 describes how the tabernacle was actually built. And what it describes is essentially a community art project. You know, they required the whole community to collaborate and chip in. It were, it was, we were told that all the materials that went into it, all the wood, the leather, the metals, the, the jewels, they were all gifted by people for free. Everybody brought things. And people gave their time. Now, this was a project that was going to need engravers, designers, embroiderers, weavers, carpenters, metal workers, and probably a lot more. And so people stepped in and they used the talents that they had. And for example, women at home, they would spin the linen that was needed and then they would bring it in in order for it then to be assembled into all the curtains and veils. And even though this was a project of volunteers, the people took it really seriously. They put effort in, their, they put in you know, their labor, they had pride in their work to make this place as beautiful as it could be. And we're told about some of the names of the workers specifically. We were told there was a man called Bezalel who was entrusted as the chief craftsman. He would precisely cut the stone, prepare you know, those, those timbers that needed to be put together um, and the complex metalwork. And we're told that he was filled with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge and all kinds of skills. And he wasn't alone either. They were told that there was another man called Oholiab who worked with him. And we're specifically told that these men were given the ability to teach. So as well as these two kind of master craftsmen, they would have had apprentices. They were passing on the skills in order to build this to the next generation. And eventually, this tabernacle was built. And, and it was ready for Moses to consecrate it. And imagine how special that day would have been. I mean, we had it as well. For you in the building, you'll be able to see we put a banner in front of it, should have moved that out of the way beforehand, that the plaque which or commemorates when the Duke of York, who later became King George, um, came to open this building. Well, it would have been like that for them, but I think even better for them, because the difference between them and, and Granton is that they had done this together. You know, if you walked into the tabernacle, you would be able to see, I sewed that, or my neighbour, he put those beams together they would have been able to see all their work assembled together. Uh, but yet, I think it would have been greater than the sum of its parts. Because what they'd essentially done was built a portal to another world. You know, one minute you're in the desert, walk into that tent and you are in the presence of the Lord. It's a really special place, a really kind of unique place for them. I've really loved reading about this story this week because it's a story about a whole community using their skills and talents to create something beautiful, and in the process, growing closer to God. 
When we make things, we use our creativity, and that can draw us closer to the creator, God, because God is the source of all creativity. You know, God used creativity to make everything around us, and we're told that God is constantly making all things new. And God gave us our gifts. He blessed some of us with the ability to draw, others to dance, others to cook. You know, whatever skill we have, God blessed us with it. And God delights when we use our gifts. In Ephesians 2, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. That word handiwork, the Greek word is poema. I should have practiced that before. Uh, that, even in that butchered pronunciation, you might notice that it's the same root as the word we use, poetry. We are God's poetry. When we make things, we're joining God as co-creators. Now, to be clear, I don't think we need to be producing masterpieces to be creative. I'm pretty sure God loves all the things we make, the duds, the, the triumphs, the ones that are very much in between. But what matters is that when we put pen to paper or get the knitting needles out or put our hands on the clay, that we open ourselves up to God. That worker, Bezalel, he was told we're told he was filled with the spirit of God as he worked. His art was an act of worship. And so when we use our skills, when we make things, we can open ourselves up to God's spirit. And then we can use it as time to spend with the creator God. I want to go back to that picture of my grandfather. Oh. They weren't that important anyway. Uh, that one. You see what we're doing? We're reading a book. Do you know what book that is? I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. Don't remember it. <laughs> who, who, who cares? Because really, that children's book wasn't really what was important about that picture. What was important about that picture is that me and my grandfather were spending time together, that we were, we were enjoying each other's company, we were making memories. When we make art and we invite God to be a part of it, really the art isn't what's most important. What's most important is it's an opportunity for us to spend time with God, to enjoy sharing that creativity with the source of creativity. So this week, um, every week I'm giving you homework, it feels like at the moment, but this week I'd encourage you to spend some time either experiencing some art, making some art, doodling, it doesn't need to be fancy. But I'd encourage you as you do it to just use it as an opportunity to spend some time with God. Allow God's spirit to be a part of the process, whether that is just looking at something, whether that's just spending time maybe in this building or in a, a different church building or a building that's got nothing to do with church. But just, I would encourage you to just, you, the key thing really is paying attention to allow ourselves to notice and notice how God might be trying to speak to us through the things that we make or the things that others have made. So for now, we're going to have a little bit of time to, to chat with one another and the people next to us. So you can turn around to people next to you or in Zoom, we're going to be into breakout rooms. And my question for you is, how do you express yourself creatively? And you're not allowed to say, I don't, because I know you all do something. So uh, a few minutes just to talk about how you express yourself creatively.
I am looking forward to hearing about all the, all the works, all the masterpieces that are going to be produced by Grantonians in the near future. Um, before we come to our prayer, um, it just occurred to me while we we're saying that we don't normally say this, so I just wanted to say, like from the front, a really big thank you to everyone who makes this space that we have look as nice as it does. Thank you to everyone who cleans. Thank you to people who make sure the chairs go back in the right order. Thank you for the flowers, for, uh, for the banners. That, a lot of work actually goes into making this place as nice as it does. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I really do appreciate it. And actually, those times before our drop-in on a Friday, when I'm in, in this room on my own, is really special to me, actually. I really enjoy it. And I really want to thank everyone who puts in that work. But now comes time for our prayers for others. Um, so if there's any names of people that you'd like included in our prayers, uh, if you would be able to shout out their first name or if you're on Zoom, if you want to type them into the chat function. George, Helen, Evelyn, George, Helen, Evelyn. Evelyn and Martin. Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. Dean. Dean and Maureen. Joseph. What was it? Did he pass away, did he? Yeah, we'll, we'll pray for his, his family and for the people who, who knew him. Christina and David. Are there any names from Zoom? Mm -hmm. Julia, Monica, Alan. Alan. Ah. Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for all your works. We thank you for the wonderful world that we live in, for all the beauty that surrounds us. We pray that we can not take it for granted to remember how, how amazing this world we have is and how much you have blessed us. And we thank you for all the people who, who use their, their time, their skills, and their talents to make this world more beautiful. We thank you for all the artists in the world, for all the people who make music, who, who make film, who, who paint, who do so much work to make our, our world just nicer, uh, a, a beautiful and vibrant place to live. We thank you for all they do and we thank you that you have inspired them with creativity um, in order to create these wonderful things. But we also know that a lot of really good art also comes from places of, of pain and suffering. We thank you that art is a place where we can express that, but we also pray for those situations that have caused that. We pray for people all across the world who are still struggling with the pandemic. We pray for people in our world who are homeless, who might be refugees, people who are living in a place of instability and uncertainty. We pray for your comfort to be with them. And we pray for people in our communities who are lonely, who are isolated, who are grieving this week. We pray that they will know that they are not alone that you are right there beside them and that you are wanting to make them new as well as everything else. So may they be strengthened in that comfort and may they be, may they know that your presence is always with them, a loving and generous presence. And we pray for all the people who we're thinking of today, all the people who's, who's, who we're thinking of who are on our minds and on our hearts. We pray in particular for George, Helen, Evelyn and Martin. For Debbie, Dean, and Maureen. For Joseph's family, all those who knew him, all those who cared for him, we pray that you will, will comfort them at this time. We pray for Christine, for David, for Pat, for Gillian, for Monica, for Alan. And we take a moment just to, to think of those people, the names spoken and unspoken. Loving God, may you bless them and keep them. May you make your face shine upon them and bring them peace this day. And for each of us 
May we go from this place with a, a renewed sense of, of life and, and a desire to, to go out into the world, to make this world that we have a more loving, a more kind and a more beautiful place. Inspire us with creativity. Help us to express ourselves to others and fill us with joy so that we can be like Psalm 150, praising you in all things. So be with us, strengthen us and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Norman's going to come up now. Um, some of you will be aware there's some big changes being planned and Norman wanted to speak to you um, in person to just let you know about what's happening. Good morning. It's really nice to be back with you today after being on holiday. Um, I should have been spending uh, over a week in Tenerife in 20 plus degrees sunshine. Guess what didn't happen? Altogether? Oh, absolutely. Hence the, the look, the peely wally white look, as you might say, that we all sport really well. However, the good news is that the trip to Tenerife has not been cancelled. It has merely been postponed. So it will hopefully come in March. I wanted to talk to you today. So some of you may well have opened the evening news this week and read a story there. And it listed a whole pile of stuff about what's happening in the, in the church. And I wanted to come and explain to you a bit about what, what exactly is going on. The Church of Scotland runs a system that was, believe it or not, set up in the year 1690. Right? So the parish system, the elders, all of that goes, goes right back to then. David's been talking about the history of, the, of, of our particular congregation in Granton. Does anyone know when the first Granton church came into being and where it was? Any guesses? Yeah, it was around the 1870s and it was in the schoolhouse. Yeah. And then if you, later on when things began to grow, and I think it was the Duke of Buccleuch around here, and he developed the whole kind of shorefront, you can see the old church in Granton, which is down, I think it's Ashworth and Draper. And um, if you ever get the chance just to say they've still got our bell, right? They have got the original bell. And then of course, in the 1930s uh, came and they opened this one. So the church still ran the same system, but within parishes, church buildings moved as people moved. And the national church, this is the entire church of Scotland, last year the General Assembly said, you know what, the system that as it was set up isn't really working today the way it was originally meant to work. So, for instance, you know, originally it was set up, you might have a parish of a couple of thousand people. Does anyone know how many folks are in Granton Parish today? There's about 12,000. And with the waterfront developments, that's due to grow to about 40,000. So it's trying to find a way, and it's, it's kind of tying into, there's a bit of art in this, yeah? and, and there's a bit of creativity in this. So it's asking the question, how do we organize ourselves today in such a way that we can fulfill the, the calling of the church and you know, go to Matthew chapter 28, go and make disciples. How do we organize ourselves in this way so that we can best do that because we recognize that the world around us has changed? Now, let me give you a couple of examples. How many of you access your doctor in the same way that you did when you were a child? Right, how many of you access your bank in the same way that you did when you were a child? The world has changed around us, but in many respects, the church has not changed around us. So the Edinburgh Presbytery is trying to find a way that we've been, they've been given a task to say, what shape is this going to have moving forward so that we can best fulfill the mission? And there is an idea, and I want to stress to you, there is only an idea. There is no set agreement. So there's, so, so there's a whole pile of ideas. Just how many read the evening news? Yeah, one or two. Yeah, you should go read the article, right? Because they list the whole thing. If you want to, I can give you the paper that we, the consultation paper, but the evening news article is much shorter mm -hmm. if, if you want to read that. And it details a whole pile of ideas on how the church should uh, organize itself. And one of the ideas for our area is that we would form a team with Wardy so that Granton and Wardy would become a unit. But I stress it's only an idea. There's a, I mean, they're talking about um, Canongate and St. Giles. They're talking about a team between Cramond, Muir House, and Drylaw. So there's teams all over the place, but these are just ideas. And so over the next four years, the 
the presbytery will wrestle with this. They will go into the creative process. Um, it is called a consultation, and we haven't had it confirmed. It is nothing more than a consultation document. It's an idea, and other ideas can be put forward. But I wanted you to hear this from the horse's mouth. I didn't want you to go away, read the article, and start putting, you know, like the octopus, arms and legs on this thing and, and letting it grow. There'll be a lot more information coming out. There'll be folks going around all the churches trying to speak to us all and saying, what is your vision? What is your, your mission? And we will be part of that. And it may be that some point in the next four years we form a team with Wardy. It may not be. At this point, we don't know. Now, it's kind of tough for David and I because we don't know where that leaves us um, as staff, but we're working that out, and we're having to live with a bit of uncertainty. But this is what I, David's given you some homework, so I want to give you some homework. There was, there was an article in the Times newspaper today saying that physicians in Edinburgh are prescribing nature walks. I don't know if you've, any of you have, have read that, to, to help people with their mental health at this time of year. And they've been telling people to go and sniff a flower. Um, before you bend down to sniff a flower in Granton, just check the flower out very carefully first before you do that, okay? But I want you to go for a walk. And I want you to walk this week around bits of this parish because the fund fundamental question that remains before us is the same, which is, how do we make Jesus real to all the people who either do live here or who will live here? And um, try and move outside your normal place that you walk. So, you know, walk to, I mean, there's an amazing amount of building. I don't know if you know where, where Mimi's Bakehouse kind of factory is down at the waterfront. Walk down that way and be amazed at the amount of building that's going up. And just ask yourself the question, how do we as a church reach these people? Because however we are organized in terms of our structure, that task, the task that we had in 1690, the task that we had in 690, will still be the task that we have in 2690. And that's the kind of, that's where our focus and our energy needs to go. Um, the Presbytery have created uh, a statement to make sure that everybody's, um, uh, kind of to use a, a, a euphemism from here, everybody's on the same hymn sheet. We have emailed this out to you if you're on email, but I will go to the back now and let David finish off. Um, you may have questions to ask. I will answer any question that you have that I am able to answer. But at this point, given it's a four-year journey that we're on, expect the answer. I dinna ken. Okay? And the other thing I'd suggest that we all do is that we all just keep ourselves in prayer in this as we go forward um, and that we, we find the best shape that fits. One of the things that Pauline and I did over Christmas, it was um, we went through an extremely difficult experience that I'll share with you. It's one of the most difficult experiences that we as a couple have gone through in the past few years. Um, Pauline said one morning, Let's clear the wardrobe out. It was, it was, it was awful. It was awful. And, and, and we were, we, we had clothes, and we had clothes that fit, and we had clothes that were aspirational. And we even had clothes that did fit, but didn't allow us to breathe. And if you had videoed the two of us that day, we were like this in the room, you know, it'll fit, it'll fit, as the dogs looking at us going like that. We're at a point in time when the shape of the national church no longer fits, and we need to find a new shape that fits. So this is, there's a Christian word, it's called discernment. We need to work out what God wants us to do. So let's all pray about this, but let's all as well, um, as I say, keep focused on the fact that Jesus wants us to basically tell everyone we know about Jesus. So I'll have these at the back, I'll answer anything I can, but um, I don't actually have a lot more knowledge than I've told you at this point. Thank you. And let us finish our worship by singing, You Shall Go Out With Joy. <laughs>
So now go out with joy and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for joining us in the building. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, stick around, chat, show off some more artwork. In the building, unfortunately, we still don't have time for tea and coffee, but if you want to chat outside, I'm sure that's fine. But may God bless you and keep you in this coming week.